Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Ethics in Research and Biotechnology Consortium series. I'm your host, In Su Hien. I'm the Director of Research Ethics and a faculty member in the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. And I'm Director of the Center for Life Sciences and Public Learning at the Museum of Science in Boston. As many of you know, this is a series that brings together science and ethics at the cutting edge of both biomedical research, biotechnology, and also uh, just research more broadly construed. Um, I wanna go over some logistics before we get started. Um, in case you don't know, this is gonna be a presentation where the main speaker speaks for a bit, and then we have Q&A at the end, hopefully about 30 minutes or so at the end of um, the presentation. Now, if you wanna submit a question to our speaker, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Don't use the chat function, use the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible during the discussion. If you have any problems or questions uh, that come up, technical issues specifically, then you might wanna use the chat function and one of us will get back to you as soon as possible. And there you can look for upcoming events at the website uh, listed there. So let me uh, introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker is uh, Gernot Wagner. He is a climate uh, economist and visiting associate professor at Columbia Business School while he is on leave from NYU. He's a columnist for, for Bloomberg, writing the Risky Climate column, and he's also written a couple of prominent books, including Climate Shock, jointly with the late Martin Weitzman, and most recently, Geoengineering the Gamble. So today he's here with us to talk about the ethics of solar geoengineering. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wagner. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, and um, yeah, I would um, like to sort of guide this discussion um, through some of the science, little of the science, sort of just to get us all on the same page, not a natural scientist myself. Um, I can pretend to play one uh, on TV. Uh, but uh, more importantly, dive directly into um, the social science and the ethics of, frankly, one of the more controversial topics within climate, climate change, and uh, not to be too bombastic here, but you know, sort of science um, more broadly. Um, what is it? What is solar geoengineering? I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a bit more of the technical details later, but just to sort of give you a bit of a sense of what I mean when I talk about solar geoengineering, I, I, I'm narrowing it down already a bit. Um, the most prominent, not the only, but the most prominent technology, potential technology um, that one often hears about in the context of solar geoengineering is what's called uh, stratospheric aerosols. Um, introducing deliberately um, tiny reflective particles into the stratosphere, about 20 kilometers or higher up in the atmosphere. Um, those tiny reflective particles reflect sunlight back and cool the planet. So the principle is, you know, on the one hand, volcanoes have been doing this forever. Um, on the other, like the, the principle, um, is um, why we were white between Memorial and Labor Day and why winter jackets are black, right? So albedo, um, the brighter uh, the surface, um, the cooler it is or the cooler um, um, the space underneath. Okay, um, that's the science. And again, I will um, go into this um, into a bit more detail and happy to go into it in much more detail in the uh, Q&A. Um, the most interesting aspects in many ways, and full disclosure, I am biased as, as an economist, social scientist here. Um, while there are clearly scientific questions, natural scientific questions, the most interesting and in many ways, most controversial aspects are all about how to even talk about solar geoengineering, geoengineering um, 
uh, more broadly, and I will get into the difference there too. Um, and what role it might, emphasis on might, play in this broader climate policy portfolio, right? So um, there's lots and lots of different ways to describe um, the sort of controversies here. Um, one is um, this idea of moral hazard. The idea that um, even talking about zoology engineering detracts from the need to cut emissions in the first place. And I don't want to dismiss this at all. It is very real. Uh, I will go into some of those details of how real it truly is. Um, but um, it's just the wrong way to look at this problem. I would argue strongly, it is the wrong way to look at this problem. Um, the right way in many ways is solar geoengineering as part of a much broader risk, risk trade-off conversation, right? There are risks of unmitigated climate change. There are risks associated with solar geoengineering. Um, there are risks with um, lots of these technologies, right? So energy engineering isn't new. I mean, you know, nuclear energy is sort of the most prominent example, perhaps within the environmental movement, right? There are risks. Well, it is also a low carbon technology. So there are potential benefits. There are very real benefits. So it's not about um, one versus the other, but it is making sure that we put the relative risks in the right perspective. Um, one way to sort of push this then is to say, um, you know, ideally, this is about um, the conversation about this topic, sort of, you know, raising the level of the discourse in general, um, and hopefully, potentially moving from what is often framed as moral hazard into this, you know, into its inverse, inverse moral hazard, where conversation about solar geoengineering actually encourages more action on the carbon cutting front, on the mitigation front, on sort of the, you know, the traditional stuff that we know is necessary. This is not either or. It must not be either or. Um, just to give you sort of a flavor of this, and you know, this is my own stuff here, but of course I'm not the only one, um, sort of this moral hazard um, thinking has a long tradition, this moral hazard framing, has a long tradition within the broader environmental movement um, within climate change itself. Okay, um, we will return to that. Um, for now, um, quick step back and sort of the broad framing of yeah, climate change, what it is we are after here, what are we even talking about when we say we ought to, well, cut CO2 emissions, or for that matter, we ought to address climate change. What is that portfolio we are talking? Okay, so lots of different versions of this graph, of graphs like this, of lines like this, right? This is global CO2, fossil CO2 emissions over time. And they have been increasing ever since we started counting them, right? There's you know, blips in there. Um, there's the 2008, uh, 2007, 2008 um, global uh, great recession. Uh, there's COVID, right? Last year, uh, two years ago, uh, CO2 emissions decreased by a lot, quite a lot. Uh, so, um, you know, May, June of 2020, when we literally, you know, shut down um, or should have shut down, frankly, but, you know, to a good extent actually did, right? Nobody commuted to work, nobody traveled. Um, uh, lots and lots of different sort of real restrictions. Um, uh, on our behavior, on our freedom, freedom of movement, right? Happened for good reason, right? I'm happy to get into some of those ethics, but um, let's not debate why it happened. It did happen. Emissions that month went down by something like almost 20% or so in that one month, right? June, uh, 2020. Overall for 2020, emissions decreased by something like five, six, 7%, depending on how, who is counting. Um, that's a lot, one view of the world. It's also, frankly, very, very little relative to what we know is in fact necessary. 
right? We need to do much, much more. We need to get emissions down to zero, not right, stabilize emissions. We need to stabilize concentration CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, the stuff that goes in, the net flow into the atmosphere needs to go down to zero, right? And right off the bat, this already you know, can tell us something about how difficult, how truly difficult it is to cut CO2 emissions, right? We shut down the world, <laughs> the, uh, uh, North America, Europe, Australia, um, um, uh, East Asia, right? Uh, everything stood and still CO2 emissions only decreased by these five or so percent for the whole year. And by the way, of course, last year, by now, CO2 emissions are you know, back up again. Um, so for the mathematicians in the room, right, the sort of last year or so, um, the increase in the increase is still increasing, right? The, the second derivative is pointing in the wrong direction here, um, even though we have to decrease emissions and do so at a much, much faster speed um, in order to stabilize global climates. Okay, now this is a you know, very highly scientific uh, rendering here of what is uh, necessary, but frankly, it's not far off of what any of these model runs will tell us is in fact necessary, which is get those CO2 emissions down to zero. If we were to be able to do so by mid-century, roughly, plus minus a couple decades, I guess plus a couple decades, minus is certainly out at this point, um, then we have a stab at limiting global average um, temperatures um, to something like 1.5 degrees centigrade um, above pre-industrial levels. And that in many ways is a very well-founded uh, political goal these days. Um, lots and lots of different countries, jurisdictions, companies have these net zero emissions goals somewhere around mid-century, right? Europe, by mid-century or before. Uh, China, by now, has a goal net zero by 2060. India, 2070. Um, you know, lots and lots of different um, um, countries, um, companies. ExxonMobil has a target of net zero emissions for its operations, right? They're still going to sell us the stuff um, for its operations right around um, uh, that time, by mid-century, by 2050. Okay, now without questioning these goals and the sincerity and the, the ways we can actually achieve that, um, let's just posit that this is a rather difficult thing to do. And when I say rather um, uh, difficult, um, yeah, there is a plan A, right? And it means cutting CO2 emissions. And that's in many ways, the first and most important step. But there is plenty of hurt already built in. There are plenty of reasons for why we would need to, want to adapt for what is already in store, right? Global average temperatures have already risen by about a degree centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Plenty of unsavory side effects um, already. And then, what, by the way, sometimes is called geoengineering as well, um, is very distinct from solar geoengineering and in many ways shouldn't be called geoengineering. Um, carbon removal, right? That's what gets to these net zero emissions. It's taking CO2 back out. Now, different ways of doing that, right? Trees have been doing it forever. Um, there's also technology to literally suck CO2 out of thin air. The big difference in many ways, trees take CO2 out, keep it in the biosphere, and when trees die, decompose, the CO2 goes back up, right? Duh. We still need to plant more trees. That's a good thing, well, stop cutting them down. But we are basically keeping the circle going, the cycle going within the biosphere. Whereas carbon capture, carbon removal technologies, take CO2 out of the air, either smokestacks or uh, uh, literally thin air, um, and bury it underground. Take it from the biosphere 
back into the geosphere where it came from, right? Where the fossil fuels um, uh, came from. So in, in, in many ways, that's the, you know, that's the, the goal here for carbon removal to in fact take CO2 back, put it back into the geosphere. Uh, that sounds expensive, it currently is, but of course, you know, unless we climb the learning curve, slide down the cost curve right about now, um, we are certainly not doing this at scale anytime soon, unless we get started um, uh, today. And you know, in many ways we are. Um, lots of research dollars, lots of real um, um, investment commitment flowing into this particular plan. Still, those three things may not, and I would argue we pretty much know, are not um, adding up to what is in fact necessary. That's not a, saying that they shouldn't, right? We should do a lot more. We, sh we need to you know, do more on all three fronts, especially of course, on cutting CO2 emissions. Um, but of course, there's a difference between you know, the world as it is and the world how it should be ideal. Um, one um, uh, reason, frankly, why I've, uh, you know, I'm sort of fairly confident to say that it would be extremely difficult to achieve um, these fairly ambitious um, climate goals is actually sort of a li little, you know, historic look. Uh, it's a little bit unfair. I'll get into that um, in a minute. But um, you know, this major um, climate economy integrated assessment model modeling effort, uh, Stanford Energy Modeling Forum. They've been at this for, for a couple of decades now, three decades or so by now. Um, there's a dozen or so, 10 different major climate economy models. Um, they have lots and lots of assumptions built in. Um, how is the climate going to develop? How is the economy going to develop? How technology is developing? Assumptions about the politics, policy, and so on and so forth. Um, those models over a decade ago basically couldn't achieve two degree centigrade that's the 450 uh, parts per million CO2 equivalent emissions here um, of average global warming with mitigation alone without massive, massive carbon removal technologies coming in, negative emissions technologies. Um, and by the way, the assumptions here are in some sense sort of crazy, right? So this is um, over a decade ago, um, the sort of, parameters given to those modeling teams at the time were assume a global maximum carbon price, global, of $1,000 per ton of CO2 starting in 2012, right? So basically, um, you know, circa 20, 2009 or so, uh, two, three years before um, that would have, could have, should have happened, basically say, um, what would happen if you could price CO2 globally at $1,000, what technologies would come in? What um, can we expect? Um, and despite these assumptions, and no, we don't have a global carbon price of $1,000, right? Not anywhere close. Um, those models simply couldn't get to two degrees centigrade of global average, right? So, that you know, bit, uh, look in the in the history here tells me simply how difficult it is to do this with mitigation with cutting CO two emissions. Although now, that was a bit unfair, because a lot has changed, right? Not just on the climate front, also of course on the technology front. Um, solar PV is now the cheapest form of electricity in history. Ten years ago, it was ten times as expensive as it is today. Now it is cheaper than any other form of electricity. Um, didn't happen by itself. Massive subsidies, German solar feed-in tariffs on the demand side, uh, Chinese subsidies on the supply side, uh, lots of ethical implications of that, especially the, the, um, the Chinese part here now, the Chinese um, um, supply side angle here. But suffice it to say, lots of advances 
it is now much cheaper to abate, to cut CO2 emissions. And that, of course, is good. It is um, uh, a big part of um, why when one looks at these sorts of scenarios I showed before in the, in the table, um, right about now, um, the picture looks you know, relatively hopeful or more hopeful. Um, this is sort of the same idea. Now we are extending the 2100, not 2050, right? So the, the dark blue line that was supposed to reach uh, zero by 2050, well, that still looks extremely ambitious, right? But even the current path, even the path we are on looks a lot better than some of these extremely, um, you know, extreme scenarios, worst case scenarios um, that frankly, the climate policy community had been looking at for, for quite a while as sort of these famous uh, debates about uh, which of these pathways are completely out uh, right about now, right? What is highly unlikely, unlikely, where would we go with current policies? Still not good enough. We need to do a lot more, but relatively, you know, more um, optimistic than some of these other scenarios one might imagine. But this is the shift, the immediate shift to um, yeah, the negative, the, the oh my God, things are potentially much, much worse after all. Um, there is this tail story out there, the you know, statistics, statistics, the statisticians in the room, the sort of the, the fat tails, the heavy tails, uh, the low probability, high impact events. In this case, um, a very quick overview of one of my own contributions to this, a, a part of this paper here, um, climatic tipping points. And sort of major changes to the climate system, or what is their impact? What is their potential impact? And in many ways, you know, lots of detail packed in here. Um, the most important point is there is a chance of things going really, really wrong, right? There's the likely, the most likely. Um, and in many ways, what we can expect would happen. And that's bad enough. But there is this long right tail. There is, unfortunately, us being able to cut off the left-hand side of this distribution not the right-hand side, right? Things are probably not going to get much better than the most likely outcome. Things may well get a lot worse than the most likely outcome, right? So ensuring ourselves against these worst case outcomes, that too is something where potentially new interventions, new technologies, Solar geoengineering, back to these risk risk trade offs, might come in, might come in in a big way. Um, so, this plan A we had before cutting CO2 emissions, cutting greenhouse gases in general, adapting to what's in store, removing CO2 from the atmosphere to get to net zero emissions, also does involve quite a bit of suffering. We can't do it all. I would argue, with those three um, alone, especially when one includes the risks, the tail risks, the uncertainties, the things, uh, uh, the, the uh, scenarios where things can go really, really wrong. Okay, so what to do? Um, point one, and maybe the most important point in all of this, there is no plan B. Despite attempts by some, uh, in some case for sort of political reasons, in some other instances simply because, oh, it sounds pretty sexy or, uh, you know, new, so let's play up a super freakonomics book here. If you look at the very first two words in the subtitle, global cooling, um, that's basically, right, to economists, so economists and journalists, right, discover solar geoengineering and basically, right, one of these G-Viz things, oh my goodness, right, all these silly people were talking about cutting CO2 emissions, look at this, we unearthed or we discovered, we found this new thing here, 
let's just cool the planet with this really, really cheap technology, not worry about all this other stuff. Um, and um, just solar geoengineer our way out of this problem. Now, let me just say right off the bat, right? That is the definition of moral hazard right here. The definition of this moral hazard framing that lots of people are rightfully worried about, right? Um, as so for the solar geoengineering to basically come in as a replacement to cutting CO2 emissions. And that, that this kind of framing that gets exploited by those with real interest in maintaining the status quo on the fossil fuel side of things, or with real interest on the side of those, um, this Newt Gingrich statement here is from 2008. He, by the way, wrote a whole op-ed around the time. Uh, what happened in 2008, major push for the Obama era um, cap and trade climate legislation, um, passed the House of Representatives, failed, fizzled, failed in, uh, in the Senate. Um, and right, more than 10 years later, we are still having the same debates around federal policy, what to do. Um, a political actor with real interest in you know, killing that effort in its infancy, pointing to solar geoengineering as the alternative, the replacement, right? Ha, told you so, no need to cut CO2 emissions. Here's the solution. Here is what else you do, right? And I would strongly argue that that's the wrong framing. It cannot be, must not be framed as either or. There is no planet B, there is no plan B. So what's the right frame? Well, maybe we can swap the suffering. Maybe we can replace the, whoa, there are things that cutting CO2 emissions, cutting methane, cutting all these other greenhouse gases, plus adapting, plus carbon removal can't do so that solar geoengineering might potentially be part of this much broader climate policy portfolio, if you will. Um, some pitfalls in describing it just the way I did as well, um, sort of all these famous political debates in the US often about all of the above strategies. What does that typically mean? Well, depends on who uses the term. It sometimes means, well, fossil fuels ought to play a role after all. Yeah, maybe coal is dead, but natural gas definitely must be part of this solution. Um, well, no, is the short answer there. Uh, first of all, it's not natural gas, it's fossil gas and so on and so forth, right? You see my biases here, um, but equally important, um, what I'm trying to do by introducing the overall conversation, framing it as maybe solar geoengineering could play a role in addition here. It is not to give those who don't want to cut CO2 emissions an excuse not to. It's quite the opposite. Okay, so not a highly scientific graph. Um, this literally actually started as a napkin diagram, back of a napkin. Um, at one of the earlier uh, solar geoengineering research conferences, uh, 2010, in this case, um, John Shepard's famous napkin diagram. Um, how can one think of solar geoengineering playing this role? There's one view, or there's sort of the, you know, the fossil fuels forever, right? We just keep going the way we are going, unlikely, based on what I showed before about how things are actually developing, but if we were to do away with all the existing climate policies and just sort of kept going the way we are, yeah, climate risk is just gonna go up and up and up. Fossil fuels forever. If we were to cut emissions to zero, and yes, we do need to cut emissions to zero, what happens? Well, climate risk stops from going up, but, there is potentially quite a lot of that climate risk, climate hurt still built in to this pathway. So that means carbon removal, right? That's the only way, you know, in our lifetimes to go back to 
of how climate risks used to be. No, we are not going to turn off all hurricanes anywhere ever or wildfires or floods and so on and so forth or heat and uh, extreme other event, uh, weather events. But that's on average overall our hope of getting climate risk back down. What's the role of solar geoengineering? It's shaving off this peak. It is reducing climate risk at its peak, at its maximum, right? Over the next few decades or so, while we get around to cutting CO2 emissions to zero, removing CO2, and yes, plenty of adaptation still necessary, right? The blue um, horizontal line here doesn't go all the way back to zero. The difference here between the x-axis and the blue line um, is adaptation, but then maybe solar geoengineering might in fact also play a role um, as part of this overall portfolio. Okay, um, back to a bit of the technology and um, what it is that we are even talking about here. We've seen this before, right? The principle reflect CO2, sorry, reflect um, uh, sunlight, solar radiation uh, back into space or allow more of it to escape um, from, um, from the surface, from the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, volcanoes have been doing this forever. Um, this is now the part of the presentation where I would have um, six months or so, three months ago, I would have shown you a picture of Mount Pinatubo erupting in the Philippines in 1991, major volcanic eruption, um, uh, global average temperatures in 1992 decreased by about half a degree centigrade, which ironically at that time, up to that point was global average warming roughly due to anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas CO2 emissions mainly. Um, this, the Tonga eruption, um, not too long ago, uh, turns out to be, you know, massive volcanic, volcanic eruption, massive consequences, people died, none of that is good, of course, but it also, its plume also introduced some SO2, tiny reflective particles, into the stratosphere that given how little material it was, about 1 50th or so of uh, Mount Pinatubo's uh, eruption, isn't expected to in fact lower global average temperatures anywhere close to what Pinatubo did in 1992. But yes, one might expect a global effect, you know, 0 0.01 degree centigrade order of magnitude plus minus, um, not a lot, certainly, not as much as um, um, as uh, Pinotubo, but the principle stands. Um, overall, we have seen volcanoes, in fact, having these real measurable impacts on global average temperatures. Right. That's in some sense what gives us what gives the scientific community the confidence in many ways that yeah, solar geoengineering would, might in fact work from a sort of purely technical sense. If one were to do this deliberately, yes, global average temperatures would in fact decrease. Okay, now one core characteristic of solar geoengineering is how truly cheap it is. Um, this is an effort, one of my own efforts, uh, to try to make sense of the various ways of, frankly, introducing SO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, into the stratosphere, right? How can you get that stuff up there? Well, when you do a uh, you know, back of the envelope, but still right, informed by the actual available technology calculation, you come to something like single digit billions of dollars, 10 billion, tens of billions of dollars per year to mask offset roughly one degree centigrade of global average um, 
or, or warming. Um, that's, well, okay, depending on your perspective, right? That's, oh my God, billions of dollars. Well, that's expensive. Well, one degree centigrade of global average warming costs trillions of dollars in damages, climate damages, unmitigated climate change, right? So in that comparison, that is, of course, very, very cheap. Um, it might also be cheap in the direct, narrow, narrow-minded maybe, economic sense of the term um, compared to cutting CO2 emissions in the first place. Again, it's not a replacement for cutting CO2 emissions, but just in raw dollar terms, yeah, we are talking single digit billions here as opposed to let's say single digit trillions of dollars in order to um, cut CO2 emissions in the first place, uh, move our entire economy from its current high carbon, low efficiency path onto a low carbon, high efficiency one, right? Now, that cheap cost, which by the way is not the right decision criteria to decide whether to do anything on the solar geoengineering front, but the fact that it is so cheap leads us to believe or allows us in many ways to look to solar geoengineering as a potential addition to this global climate uh, policy portfolio because it has these very different core characteristics from cutting CO2 emissions in the first place. So global climate change, the global problem, sort of any economist ever would say, oh, this is a free rider problem. Right? There's various definitions of this, but it's basically about it being so expensive, increasingly cheaper, but still expensive and a massive coordination problem, a massive problem of all of us together coming together and deciding to cut CO2 emissions. Now, no, we shouldn't be sitting around for the perfect global agreement, right? And now plenty of um, uh, reasons to believe that things are really changing on that front. Um, emissions are coming down. Um, uh, Germany, energy vendor um, investment in low carbon technology on a massive scale and so on and so forth. Lots of us doing the right thing, wanting to do the right thing, companies going net zero and so on and so forth. Still, the core characteristic could be, in the very simple terms, described as this free rider problem. Solar geoengineering has the exact opposite properties. If anything, this is now one of the most important ethical problems here. This is not about motivating more people to do more. If anything, it might be, uh, the name of the game here might be stopping people from doing too much, too soon, stupidly, right? That we still may want to do a lot of work or research to motivate, incentivize, guide people in the right direction here, channel these free driver forces in the right direction. Um, but the fact that it is so cheap the, in the narrow-minded, deployment cost sense of the term um, tells us that there is in fact a different um, problem, a different question here, a set of questions here than the mitigation, the traditional mitigation problem of cutting CO2 emissions in the first place, right? That's what, that's what makes it interesting academically. It makes it interesting from a policy perspective. It raises many of these ethical problems. So one conclusion, one strong conclusion to draw from this is, no, it's not a question of if we are going to do this. It's a question of when. Right? Um, it's just a matter of time that somebody somewhere, some country somewhere, lots of different scenarios one can think of, uh, and think about how this might actually happen, um, are, is going to pull the trigger. Right? Not if, but when. OK, now, now we are to the, uh, back to the trade-offs and to some very, very hard ethical um, questions here. Right? There are in fact, right, some hard trade-offs between cutting CO2 emissions, mitigation, um, and solar geoengineering. And then there is this whole moral hazard concept of how do we react as a society, as politicians, as policymakers, as the scientific community, um, given those 
very different sets of properties of these two technologies. So very briefly, the hard trade-offs. Um, when one uh, tries to estimate the direct cost per ton of CO2, the CO2 equivalent cost of solar geoengineering, the numbers are just striking. They are very, very low. Now, in many ways, that's not the right way to think about it. It shouldn't be, it must not be for lots of good reasons. But again, this free driver property, the fact that um, in this scenario here, um, if one were to turn off global average warming for the rest of this century, once and for all, through solar geoengineering, you're essentially turning off carbon cycle feedbacks, right? More CO2, more warming, more CO2 being released. If you turn that off, not that that's the right thing to do, but if you were to do that, you could decrease global CO2 burden by the end of the century by some world order of magnitude, five to 25%. And the cost is just really, really cheap, less than half a dollar per ton of CO2 um, reduced. Not the full answer, not the right answer, um, not in many ways the desirable outcome, but yeah, given the, um, uh, this sort of fundamental calculation, we are once again faced with this hard trade-off between solar geoengineering on the one hand and cutting CO2 emissions on the other, faced with this free driver um, effect. Happy to go into details. I see a couple Q&A questions coming up here. I will actually, let me pause here quickly. Did this model, Priya Dave is asking, did this model account for carbon capture or simply decreased emissions? That was a Stanford model. Oh, Should got it. Stanford. Sorry, I'm way behind here. Okay, yeah. sorry. So. Um, actually, you tell me, should I address the questions now or should I? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till the end. We will. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I will. Sorry, I will ignore questions for now. Um, okay, so, um, right, it's very cheap. Okay. But again, maybe some of the more interesting questions are in fact about the moral hazard of it all. The interactions here between solar geoengineering on the one hand and uh, mitigation efforts. Um, um, on the um, sort of on the front of how do we actually react to the availability of this um, technology? Okay, just to put sort of some structure to this, um, and I can tell you this is sort of a very um, <laughs> a very personal decision matrix here. Um, uh, I was the founding co-director, uh, executive director um, with David Keith at Harvard of this solar geoengineering research program. And frankly, right, um, you know, when one tackles one of these new efforts, right, it's sort of, it's, it's good to sort of take a step back and say, hey, is this a good idea to do, right? And, you know, we can think of sort of this decision matrix, right? Should we start a serious research program? Yes or no? Well, if not, what happens? Okay, if you believe this not if but when scenario, what you're essentially doing, this is the bottom branch here of this tree, you're slittering into this uninformed deployment decision, right? And then if you decide not to do it, fine, nothing happened. If you do decide to deploy solar engineering, not having done the hard work, not having done the research, well, all bets are off. Okay. What if you decide to do an active research program? Well, if you find that it might actually work, that solar engineering can reduce climate risks, now suddenly you're able to make a more informed um, decision of whether to deploy it, yes or no, right? And then if you decide to do it, you might in fact believe, know that uh, climate risks are going to be reduced as a result. Of course, if you still decide not to deploy solar geoengineering, nothing happens. Right. Okay. Um, and then, of course, if you you know negative findings, it's too risky. It just doesn't work. You don't deploy it. Nothing happens. This, of course, <laughs> in many ways, is one 
too rational a view of the world, a, a view of the world, right? This is just not how the real world works. Or put differently, there is such a thing called moral hazard. There is this real trade-off between, you know, going down any road, frankly, and the implications of what it might do to our other decision making. So in this case, right, the sort of claiming that there is no change if you do research in zoology engineering just isn't really true. There is change. Things do change because of this moral hazard property, right? You give, sorry, uh, you give, you know, you give Newt Gingrich new ideas. You, um, you give others who have vested interest new ideas about, wait, this allows us to point to zoology engineering now, right? Oh, those Harvard folks are doing that research. So look, they're going to bail us out this new technology here. It's just not worth it. It's too expensive and so on to cut CO2 emissions, right? That's the moral hazard. It might be wrong rationally on the substance, but if that's where the op-ed pages are going, right? If this is where um, some are trying to push the conversation, um, at the very least, it's not legitimate to claim that there's not going to be a change. Okay, so let's try to make sense of this moral hazard um, framework a bit more, right? Theoretically, very well-founded. There's a long history of this idea. Yes, there are trade-offs. Um, it's also a misnomer. So in this case, it is not in fact the same as the moral hazard definition that economists often use when they talk about uh, health insurance or any kind of insurance, right? Now you are protected against the worst outcome by somebody else. So now you engage in risky behavior, right? Lots and lots of different examples you know, from health insurance on the one hand, you know, condoms, lots and lots of different right, te um, technologies, if you will, um, that depending on your political leaning, right, you would claim are simply a distraction create a moral hazard, therefore shall not be even considered, right? So what might be health insurance or reproductive technology on, on one side of the political spectrum might be nuclear power on the other. And of course, zoology engineering potentially as well. Now, yes, some of that moral hazard trade-off is really rational. There is a trade-off, right? If you have a seatbelt on, it is rational to drive a little bit faster, yes true, but most of it is in fact this behavioral idea, the lack of self-control, whatever you might call it, but it goes through behavioral changes, how we as individuals react. Um, now, what can we say about this? Well, um, turns out lots of research has been done on this idea of right, what people actually think when they think about zoology and engineering, uh, frankly, the most important characteristic, nobody knows what it is. 20, 30% in your average survey might claim that they have heard of it. When do you then probe a little bit more? Hardly anyone can define it. Right. Um, what's also true is that we ought to have, it's not always, apparent, but we ought to have very nuanced views, a um, uh, difference in views here between the research, right? Decision of whether to research the technology versus decision of whether to deploy it, whether to actually have global impact through this, um, uh, through this technology. Now, in many ways you can say, look what uses they're doing the research if it's not about eventual deployment. Yes, lots of interesting questions there too. Um, but at the very least, we have to draw a distinction here. Um, risk and uncertainty, right? Crucial component here. Um, when one asks the general public about perception of solar engineering, risk and uncertainty certainly play a large role as they ought. Meanwhile, there are surveys out there on sort of probing this moral hazard versus inverse moral hazard idea. And I can tell you there's something like, um, as, at, at of, as of this time, five years ago, when we did this survey, there are something like 30 or so zoology engineering public opinion surveys. And essentially every single one of them showed 
the existence of moral hazard. Every single one of them showed that um, there is a problem uh, of introducing solar geoengineering vis-a-vis -vis the desire to cut CO2 emissions in the first place. But two points. One is based on a survey conducted by Christina Merck um, et al., um, also published five or so years ago. Uh, full disclosure, Christina Bernard is a co-author, um, but I was certainly not involved in this study. It was her asking and asking in a revealed preference setting, right? Actually observing people's behavior, in this case, 660 Germans, but yeah, people nonetheless. Um, how do you actually react when you hear about solar geoengineering? Right, so have to go into the details, but you know, one of these experiments, right? Certain part of the population gets told about solar geoengineering. Are they now more or less likely in this case to offset their own emissions with their own money? Are they actually, uh, is there actually a difference in their behavior once they're told about solar geoengineering? What did Christina Merck et al find? They found inverse moral hazard. Those who were told about SAIs, stratospheric aerosol injection, solar geoengineering, um, were more likely to offset more of their emissions because they had just heard about solar geoengineering, right? So actually, in this revealed preference setting, the exact inverse of moral hazard. Right now, lots of questions there. Um, uh, lots of questions about offsets, right? Are they really uh, useful in combating solar geoengineering, uh, sorry, uh, climate change, and so on and so forth, right? And of course, lots more work to be done, and that's where my joint work with uh, Christina Merck comes in now. Um, in part, lots of other studies too, of course. But still, the one revealed re preference survey out there shows the exact inverse of moral hazard. Meanwhile. Um, I said out with um, actually a professor in the government department, Dustin Tingley, and a PhD student, former PhD student there, um, Asim Mahajan. Um, we did a solar engineering uh, survey, opinion survey, right? ask questions of um, a, thousand, a group of a thousand uh, participants in the US um, right around the time of the um, 2016 election, by the way. Um, and what we did there was probe a little bit further into this moral hazard question. Frankly, um, we are not the first ones to do this, of course, in not different contexts. Lots of people have you know, discovered the fact that how you ask the question matters. It matters a lot. So frankly, what we found here was the moral hazard findings of these 30 plus past surveys, most likely were subject to what's often called acquiescence bias. How you ask the question matters. We ask the question two ways, right? Is the, does the availability of solar engineering make it more likely do you want to cut emissions or the other way around, right? Does it make you less want to cut emissions? Depending on how you ask the question, people agree with you, acquiescence bias, right? So in other words, yes, we also would have found moral hazard a weak version of moral hazard. Had we asked the question only more, one way, right? Will motivate society to cut emissions less? We asked it both ways. We found both results. So in other words, acquiescence bias, if anything dominates, moral hazard may not be such a strong um, result um, after all. Um, that, that too should make us a bit dubious of these moral hazard findings out there that says, oh, you know, introducing solar geoengineering is going to decrease our desire to cut um, emissions. Now, there's another sort of component to this, and um, I, I will end on this uh, thought, but um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. They're very prominent <laughs> conspiracy theories. Um, this is us analyzing um, uh, social media discourse, if one can call it that, on um, geoengineering. And what we found was the vast, vast majority of this discourse, of the um, um, conversations, tweets, uh, Facebook posting on geoengineering, basically were 
chemtrails conspirators talking about how, right, I mean, opinions differ on what the actual theory is here, but uh, essentially, um, right, any contrail up there, any, any plane currently flying in the sky is some sort of chemtrail, some sort of chemical attack on the rest of us. And yeah, opinions differ whether it's for weather modification on the one hand, or you know, mind control or worse, right? So there is lots of different um, versions of this. So another sort of layer here to the you know, discourse, if you will, where you can probably say that, uh, look, given those conspiracy theories, it's very hard to say what quote unquote, the public truly does think about this potential technology, geoengineering, um, solar geoengineering, if what's currently out there is sort of this morass of right, half the tweets, more than half, depending on which, which month you look at, right, or which week in the, you look at, um, sort of 80, 90% of what you can read about geoengineering online is in fact conspiratorial, right? Not a hopeful um, picture. Um, let me turn this off very quickly. I have one more slide to go, but instead of um, flipping through the rest of my presentation here, let me fast forward. Um, so there are now very different uh, sort of ways to, um, um, to talk about the, um, the um, implications of moral hazard, um, lots of different policy implications of it. Let me just end with this here, which is to say, um, oops, sorry, there we go. Um, which is to say, um, at the end of the day, lots and lots of good legitimate concerns about solar geoengineering, about solar geoengineering research. Absolutely. Now, I would argue that's what points to the need to do more research in the first place, right? Nobody here is talking about, should we be deploying solar geoengineering today or tomorrow? It's about, should we be doing more research in order to have the potential, the possibility of doing um, um, the deployment eventually down the line. Meanwhile, and actually I should mention here that, that usually whenever everyone writes in column or op-ed or so, right, it's usually sort of, you make fun of the editor or you uh, complain about the editor, right? You, you wrote those well-crafted 1,500 uh, uh, words or so, and then the editor comes in and sort of, you know, clickbait, right? Comes up with a title that just, sort of doesn't quite capture what you meant to say. In this case, I can say my editor who did come up with this uh, title, I didn't, this is one of my Bloomberg columns, um, captured precisely what I meant to say and much better than I had done uh, before with whatever title I had suggested. Um, fear of geoengineering, geoengineering now in the all encompassing sense, both carbon removal, but predominantly maybe solar geoengineering is really the anxiety that lots of us do legitimately feel about us not cutting CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in the first place, right? fast enough, ambitiously enough, right? So in many ways, you know, this is a, a paraphrasing of this moral hazard argument, if you will. Yes, it's a legitimate fear. Absolutely, I fear it too. But of course, the real question is, should that dominate the solar geoengineering conversation? Or should we try to do something about precisely this legitimate fear, try to address it, and maybe try to find ways to have me a talk, me a conversation about solar geoengineering, in fact, allow us to have a better, more reasoned, more all-encompassing dialogue about why it is even more important to cut CO2 emissions in the first place. Um, thank you. And I look forward to no longer ignoring the questions in the Q&A and <laughs> discussing this. <laughs>
Well, terrific. Thank you so much. That was such a provocative and interesting presentation. We're getting questions coming in. Uh, so while I'm, I'm grouping these questions into various categories, let me just start by asking one of my own questions. I didn't really get a sense for a couple of things about the technology. So whenever you have these uh, proposals for a new technology, new technological approach, a lot of people who are concerned about risks will ask things like, how reversible is the technology? You know, how avoidable are the harms? What are the harms? And like, how often would you have to deploy this technology? So let me just ask those very basic questions to you yeah. directly. Um, would you have to do this often? How would you control where the shading happens? And if one country decides to do it, how can one actually control it in a way that does not affect the neighborhood, which did not want this uh, to be deployed? So just some of those like control questions, reversibility, how often, if you can address those. Um, absolutely. Okay, so uh, a couple core features here. Um, one is this is in fact a global intervention, a global potential intervention, right? So to your last part of your question about, right, if one country were to want to do this and another one doesn't, right, what happens? It turns out that it is, right, a global thermostat one is setting here. Um, this is not, right, one country, Philippines, somebody right wants to cool the you know temp, uh, air above its territory and nobody else is affected right that's just not how this works right when pinatubo erupts in the philippines within weeks um the so2 has uh spread around the globe and global average temperatures decrease right now okay that's both a feature and a flaw right it's a feature because well no solar engineering is not a weapon Right? This is not sort of directing at somebody, you know, freezing them over there kind of thing, right? Um, I'm sure there's a cartoon somewhere about, you know, some weapon that freezes, you know, the, 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 the target here. Uh, no, it can't be used as that, right? Because it does it globally. Now, that's the feature, right? The flaw, yeah, this is an extremely powerful potential technology where in some sense, well, the big question is, how can we globally come together and govern such a powerful technology? What do you do if or since, in many ways, it is available, right? It's not, a, again, the, the not if, but when, right? It's also part of that, you know, me talking to you about this right now isn't going to make it more likely that somebody somewhere is going to deploy it, right? We know it's out there. It's been out there for decades, right? We know about this. Um, okay, so that's, that's the second part. Um, what are some of the risks? What are the, some of the consequences? Well. Uh, depends on who you're asking, just to be clear. <laughs> um, there are risks. Yes, there are. But the overall broad conclusion of if one were to do stratospheric aerosol solar geoengineering gradually, globally, and it's very hard not to do globally, just to be clear, um, essentially what you do is you bring radiative forcing, how much solar radiation reaches the surface, closer back to pre-industrial levels, right? So what does that mean? You decrease climate risk. You lower global climate risk. Now, why am I so confident? There are in fact hundreds, thousands of climate model runs simulating what would happen, what might happen. And if anything, this is sort of, you know, both surprising and, you know, frightening, if you will, but this technology looks too good. Um, global average temperatures, extreme temperatures, global average precipitation, extreme precipitation, all those metrics sort of on a global level, disaggregated and how it affects individual, you know, pixels on the, you know, one by one degree grid cells on the, on the, on the globe brings them, brings the vast, vast majority of these grid cells closer back to pre-industrial and basically none go further away, right? So some might be sort of unaffected and you know, statistical uncertainty and so on in any of these model runs, of course. Um, but that's the, you know, that's sort of, that's what gives me the confidence to, in some sense, want to continue this conversation, right? Because, you know, it seems to work. You know, it seems to work as advertised. Now, just to be clear, it's not anti-CO2, right? It, doesn't solve climate change. It just doesn't. Ocean acidification, not addressed 
by serology engineering, right? It's about cl uh, global average temperatures, potentially pre precipitation as well, sort of the atmosphere. It's not about many of these other nasty, unsavory consequences of unmitigated climate change. Thank you. Uh, so we have several questions that are coming in about governance. Um, and let me let me frame the governance question in the following way. Um, so some group of scientists and climate researchers had recently, just I think in January of 2022, submitted what they call the Solar Geoengineering Non-Use Agreement. Uh, and in there, among the many claims they make, which I think in, in many ways you've already addressed in your talk, but one of the claims I thought was fascinating was that they argue there's no current global governance system for something like this. For example, United Nations General Assembly, United Nations Environment Program, these other United Nations groups, um, they argue are not capable of equitable and effective multilateral control over this technology and deployment. Uh, even the Net UN uh, Security Council, which is dominated just by, I think, five countries, uh, they lack the global legitimacy that would be required to effectively regulate this. Um, so, so, so two thoughts come to mind. I mean, one is you're advocating for research. How do you distinguish between research and actual deployment? Like, how would you do research without some form of deployment? But, but getting back to the governance issue, and again, I think uh, several people had the governance questions. Steve Latham, hey Steve, uh, from Yale had that question. John T. Lunchoff at Harvard had that question about um, you know, decision-making. Can you address the governance issues there? Um, uh, let me try. So, um, so yes, I'm very familiar with this non-use agreement uh, making, um, making the rounds. Um, I, um, well, there's a lot to say, let's put it that way. Um, there is a lot to say about how this came about um, and not to dismiss the entire effort completely, but there was a version of this non-use agreement with the editor of the journal, which ended up publishing it as a co-author. And then just, you know, when it was published that editor's name disappeared from the co-author list, um, and he is the editor in chief of the journal where it was eventually published. Now, okay, without getting into sort of the research ethics of that, lots and lots of questions here. Um, but okay, so what about it? What about a moratorium, right? I mean, no, non-use agreement, fancy word for, or longer phrase for, you know, moratorium. Let's not do it, right? Um, and yeah, their argument is um, in some sense twofold. It's, um, you know, it, it's basically, it's not a good idea, right? So the, the reason for this non-use agreement, it's, so, you know, just to be clear, it's like a collection of, you know, scholars um, who strongly believe solar engineering is a bad idea. Deployment is a bad idea, right? We can't do it, we shouldn't use it, it's ungovernable, um, it's just something thou shall not touch. And therefore, and actually opinions differ among the co-authors, just to be clear, but, and therefore we shouldn't be researching it either, right? Now, again, so I'm, I'm biased here, let's put it that way. Um, but I can tell you, um, my, my, the co-founder of Harvard Solar Geology Research Program, in many ways a much more visible figure, David Keyes, um, who is still running the Solar Geology Research Program. Uh, and in many ways, is sort of the standout figure, right? Sort of the, the, the person who everyone associates with this desire to pursue solar geology research. He, almost a decade ago, co-authored an article, Science, with Ted Parson, that called for a moratorium on solar engineering deployment that basically called for a non-use agreement. If you define use as deployment of the technology. I just wrote this book called Geoengineering the Gamble. In it, second to last chapter, I call for a moratorium. I call for a non-use agreement <laughs> on the deployment of the technology. Okay, why? Right? Why would he do that? Why Ted Parson, David Keith? Why did I do this? Why do lots of others talk about this? Because there is in fact a real difference between research on the one hand and deployment on the other, right? The sort of, you know, the sort of research, the most ambitious research projects proposed 
on the solar geoengineering front are you know outdoor experiment fly a balloon into the stratosphere release material this is one of the more prominent proposals hasn't happened yet but uh proposals uh that the harvard group um that you know, i was affiliated with no longer um is um is suggesting to do wants to do um the direct impact of this experiment even if we you know not even proposing to release so2 but even if that were the case the total release of substance here into the stratosphere so this whole experiment would be less than one airplane releases in one minute of flight and there's what 40,000 of them up there right now over the US and uh, you know as many over Europe or you know 20,000 30,000 so over Europe right um, so in other words the actual real world impact of this experiment is basically zero now of course that's not what this is about right it's not about the direct impact it's about opening the floodgates it's about slippery slope arguments it's about um uh this balloon flight proposed balloon flight being a symbol for much much more right being sort of for oh the person writing op-eds about how solar engineering might be a good idea wants to do an experiment that might show that solar engineering could be a good idea right it's it's about that it's about much much more it's about this flight this balloon flight being a symbol um about for for this broader research and in many ways and there you know just to be clear i am biased right i'm fully biased i fully acknowledge this um i don't understand how the distinction between research and deployment got lost in the process of writing that non-use agreement you mentioned and in some sense, how they got away with it, right? Or how they sort of, how it's possible to write a non-use agreement that in some sense explicitly, when you look at the terms, basically talks about, oh, legitimate climate research, of course, you know, full permission for research. And then, you know, if you follow some of the co-authors of this agreement on Twitter, let's say, or various email lists or various conversations since it came out, uh, not everybody, but many co-authors of this agreement then say no 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 we also meant research or you know opinions differ at the very least right now okay what does that tell me right so you know sign on letters are always hard right everyone has their own opinions how do you agree to sort of a on a complex topics like topic um like this nearly impossible um really i guess what is reflected here in the in the actual publication of this is simply, look, it's a group of scholars who in part viscerally, in part um, for good reason, are opposed to solar geoengineering, don't like it. And therefore, you know, let the outcome justify the means, if you will. Um, even though, right, and this is the, you know, as, as, as a, as somebody who has called for a non-use agreement himself, basically, right? Um, I would say there would have been, there could have been, there should have been a better way to make this point, the same point, except of course, well, frankly, back to my very last slide, right? The, the headline I showed, right? Really what we are showing here is that there is a more visceral opposition to solar engineering research even precisely because of this fear of moral hazard, of this fear of, and you know, very real fear, right? Yes, Newt Gingrich is going to exploit it. He already has. Saudi Aramco is going to exploit it. Every dollar of their $25 billion of raw profits last quarter, right? Um, points in the direction of this being in their narrow self-interest. Um, to you know, pursue, play up, and therefore delay cutting uh, CO two emissions. Okay, sorry, that was a very long answer to a good question, but you know, there's a lot packed in here, and sure. frankly, um, I guess as a as a as an op ed, as an argument, perfectly justified in some sense, right? They don't like solar engineering. They sign something that says that they don't like it. Um, the fact that it is disguised as a scientific paper as a peer-reviewed paper, which it is, <laughs> uh, it's in a peer-reviewed journal, um, just adds a whole different layer of complexity here that frankly, yeah, I'm biased, um, 
but will tell me that this was not the cleanest, clearest way of going about making this argument. Well, um, so it, I have another question that's come in that's actually, I think, pretty far along the spectrum of, of supporting solar geoengineering. So uh, what she wrote was, assuming research on solar geoengineering continues unhalted and with sufficient investment funding and global coordination, what will it take to get governments, let's focus here just on the US, not only to listen, but act and move towards deployment? <laughs> so, so more on the positive end of this. Uh, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Right. Um, it took me like uh, 80 minutes to finally make the, the mute mistake here on Zoom. Uh, so, um, okay, so what would it take? So what it takes really is to elevate the level of discourse on solar change. What it takes is to um, have, you know, reasoned, non-conspiratorial and so on, conversation about how, no, it's not a solution. No, it doesn't detract, it shouldn't detract from the need to cut emissions and so on and so forth, but should, and this is right, very concrete, sort of addressing the US question, should there be a research program in the US federally funded, you know, to the tune of, let's say 10, $15 million per ton, uh, per million dollars, per year, um, um, which, by the way, the National Academies called for. It's a National Academies report on governance of solar engineering research that came out last uh, spring. Um, calls for that order of magnitude. And just to give you a sense, $10, $15 million compared to something like $2, 3000000000 billion of federal climate research funding overall. Now, you know, in some sense, that might be an inflated figure because it counts satellites and other things, right? Um, so you can get to a couple billion very quickly that way, but a GCS, a, G, um, a global uh, change research program um, that coordinates this climate research within the White House, uh, yeah, tallies two to three billion dollars of climate research. So should solar geoengineering ever dwarf that figure? No, absolutely not. Must not be the case. Um, is it justified to look at 10, 15 million dollars, which by the way is 10, 15 million dollars more than currently is? spent at the federal level? Yes, absolutely. Um, and frankly, in many ways, that is the path toward having a more reasoned, well-informed conversation on this topic. It's the only path. We have to do the research in order to figure out whether, whether we should do anything more, right? And again, there's the rational view. Like I showed this little you know, matrix, really, you do the research, you figure out some heretofore unexplained risk and suddenly, right, you trying to kill this program in its infancy, basically, or in some sense, the opposite that says, look, we're doing the research. Um, we thought there were these risks. We looked at them. They don't seem to be a problem. So let's go further down the slide, which actually the one, the first half of your very first question, and so that I didn't respond to before was this sort of control nature, right? And one feature of solar engineering is that you do have to continuously do it, right? It's not like CO2, every ton emitted today sticks up there forever, right? 40% of what's emitted today is still there a thousand years from now. No, SO2 from the stratosphere falls out after 18 or so months, it's gone. So you need to continue in order to maintain the program, right? Which gives you a lot more control here to frankly, <laughs> You know, scale up slowly, test, experiment, scale up again, pull back if you find something that you don't like, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, several other questions have come in that I'm going to put into a theme, but but in order to sort of transition over to that, um, it's interesting to me that a lot of the conversation I've heard so far from you reminds me of the conversations people have around human genome editing of the germline. Research versus deployment, which might be reproductive use, right? Mm -hmm. And how uh, um, it's kind of a global, like the gene pool is a global <laughs> resource. And just because one country does it doesn't mean that it won't then leak out uh, to other other uh, germlines. Um, so can you, I mean, many people think that, well, they know that global warming will disproportionately negatively impact poorer nations, people living uh, in, in much, much more uh, socioeconomically dire situations, 
close to the equator, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that they, sh they should have a greater say in, in the debate? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because it seems like from what you're saying, this is a technology that will likely develop in a, in a developed country. Uh, much more much more so than somewhere else um, but it looks like the potential impact maybe even benefits might uh, disproportionately fall on other communities uh, other nations should there be should there be a greater weight placed on people who normally don't get get uh, a voice at that table uh, so yes and no right so actually there's a there's this uh, one sentence in this non-use agreement that basically says this technology must be governed by giving in some sense the global south um you know giving control of governance to the global south to which my response would be um nothing we do at the international level has this sort of structure right we could argue that it would be desirable right that the un security council is a highly imperfect way of organizing ourselves and that the p5 the five prominent members uh you know post-World War II might have been representative of the world order and fine to do that in you know, the 50s or to stick with that order in the 50s. But right about now, it's just a sad reflect a reflection of the inadequacy of, of, of the United Nations, right? And the way we organize our international governance here. Uh, you know, so yes to all of the above. Now, to your more uh, you know, substantive question, should those who are most affected have a larger voice? Yes, the voice should be right commensurate with how one is affected in many ways, uh, which by the way, right? This is sort of, you know, both at the global level and, uh, and uh, domestically too, of course, but in this case, what matters primarily is the global level. Um, of course, the poor are more affected by climate change. They are affected more by unmitigated climate change they have a higher stake in the outcome here. They do, right? It's sort of the usual, right? The rich adapt, the poor suffer. Yes, of course. Okay, so solar geoengineering, the potential use of solar geoengineering, yes, it has the larger positive consequences on the world's poor, on the poor within the US, on the poor within New York City, right? Within Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? The poor are more affected by unmitigated climate change than, um, than the yeah. rich. And yeah, on the global level, same thing. Yeah, well, that, that's the perfect then intro to this next question. I think I'm, I know what you're gonna say. So uh, Attendee asks, do you have thoughts on whether a reframing of solar geoengineering as a humanitarian intervention, potentially capable of reducing the total human suffering in the world, or maybe in this case, in, in disproportionately uh, a lot more suffering in some parts of the world, might change the debate surrounding research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, mean, you know, I, I can go into detail, but, but yes, right? So precisely because um, um, it is in many ways, right? So, okay, so not to be too philosophical here, but why do I care about, you know, why am I an, why am I an environmentalist? Because I care about people, right? And so, you know, yes, you know, some are environmentalists because they care about the, like, the planet's going to be fine. Thank you very much. I mean, the rock, right, is going to be fine. Ecosystems, of course not, will suffer. Um, but um, uh, yes, of course, this is about being a humanitarian in the all-encompassing sense of the term. Now, as soon as you say that, right, as, you know, middle-aged white guy in my case, right, so now paternalism comes in and so on and so forth, of course, right? Um, um, and, the, you know, the the old world order and the very wrong world order. So no, this is not about right, us with the savior complex in the global north, right? Trying to pretend or pretending to have all the answers, of course not. Um, so yes, it's about reframing or, uh, so it's, it's not, it's about reframing. Yes, reframing it as a humanitarian intervention would certainly change the debate. Um, and, you know, yes, now we are, you know, in sort of the day-to-day -day politics of it all, right? There are NGOs who are working on doing just that. And in some sense, there are NGOs who are so opposed to the technology that they are working hard not to have this reframing happen, right? That's happening too. And yeah, that both of them are happening precisely because it would, it would make a difference. 
Yeah, I, I'm intrigued by your uh, idea of inverse moral hazard as basically, as, as I understand it, the opportunity for people when they consider geo, solar geoengineering to have a discussion about these other climate mitigation efforts and that. Uh, and so it actually is a conversation starter, not something that, you know, that, that shuts or demotivates people from looking at other alternatives. But, you know, I, I get more and more skeptical about the, uh, the, the, the ability of people to have these kinds of conversations and to learn from one another's perspectives. I just think that we're just so polarized. What do you think, practically speaking, if it's just, if it's just better strategy, because we have to do something, better strategy to, to get trusted groups to sort of endorse it, right? So I, I can imagine there could be some people who identify very strongly with the Sierra Club or Greenpeace, if they came out in support of it, or even people identify very much with Newt Gingrich and they, they like him, right? And if he endorses it, maybe Bill Gates supports it. There could be, that could be good or bad because there are people who are very, very uh, concerned about Bill Gates' motivations, apparently. Uh, but just getting like key, key people like that or organizations like that to back it up. And so people kind of take that support as a surrogate for the conversation that I think maybe they really are not capable of having politically. And the overall effect is basically that you get movement in the right direction, you get support. And uh, maybe that's the case where we really do want um, conservatives and um, you know, those who don't identify as conservatives to come out and support this. What are your thoughts about that kind of more pragmatic thing? Because I, I understand your ideal, hey, yes. this is a conversation starter, we should have a discussion, but I don't know if people are really capable of that these days. Uh, I don't know either. Um, frankly, you know, I... <laughs> Let's put it that way. I spend too much time on Twitter. Um, personal failing. Um, and yeah, let's put it that way. There is a, uh, like the, the level of discourse, and of course, you know, Twitter is just a micro car, right? It's not the real world and so on. But, uh, you know, much like the chemtrails, so that's the extreme end of the spectrum, right? This is sort of the, like, I mean, just to give you, some, like, my wife is literally an abortion doctor. She gets, you know, she gets death threats. I get them too from the chemtrailers, right? She at least does what people accuse her of doing. And sort of that's the world we live in, right? Um, and it's just crazy, right? Now, okay, it's not to make too much of the, you know, this, you know the one handwritten crazed letter from, you know, a couple of weeks ago kind of thing. But on the other hand, yeah, right? So what hope is there? Now, okay, that's the crazy end of the spectrum. That's literally the conspiracy theory, right? Sort of what you have talked about in some sense, you know, you mentioned the thing, which I did, of course, too, right? Um, so yes, yeah, the former leader of the house, right? Uh, who, you know, one might argue in many ways has himself turned into a more polarizing figure very consciously, precisely because that's how the conversation is going. Right, and not to be too political, but yeah, it's you know when you look at sort of fairly neutral analyses of the the politics and sort of political polarization, one side moved much much further from the center than the other side, right? And the fact that somebody very much part of that one side, right, um, then also uses climate as a wedge issue, right, is clear. That's clear. Um, the hope of having solar engineering elevate that part of the climate conversation, uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't, there's no hope, right? Like solar engineering just introduces yet another wedge, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can tell you during the four Trump years, right? Like the biggest worry I had while I was, you know, uh, executive director of the solar engineering research program was basically sort of the presidential tweet, right? Like sort of, you know, mm -hmm. You know, like 4 a.m., right? Ha, huh, found solution to climate change, right? Here, go do that, right? And here's the site to the Harvard program kind of thing, right? The link to the, like, can you imagine sort of what that sort of the polarization? Now, it turns out it never happened, um, which is good, right? But of course, you know, who knows, right? It's next time around, right? Um, and it's one of these things where, well, in this case, right, this very real question, right? I was talking about the need for federal research money. Well, right about now, well, why there is a lot of hap happening in sort of the science policy community in the White House you know, or STP and so on, right? And while there, while there are lots of good things happening, moving in the right direction, should there also be the 10, $15 million in solar engineering and research? Yes. Back then, during the, you know, those four years, right? That was the last thing we needed 
right? Can you imagine basically everything else gets scaled down and that's the one research program being emphasized by the White House as the one, right? That would have right, been detrimental to sort of a semi-rational um, debate here. So yes, right, politics, day-to-day -day politics clearly figures into this and you know, sadly not always in a good way. Well, I'm glad you are not the victim of a Donald Trump tweet. <laughs> Um, and with that, I'm going to have to conclude because we're out of time, but I want to thank our speaker, uh, Gernot Wagner, for presenting today. I would also like to thank the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics for their support in sponsoring this event, and Ashley Troutman and Helen Stephanidis for their help in organizing today's talk. And I also want to thank you, our guests, for joining us today. This series will return next month on March 25th where our speaker will be James Fishkin, who's the director of the Stanford University Center for Deliberative Democracy. If you're interested in more these issues of deliberation and public engagement, please join us on March 25th. We hope to see you then. And with that, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you.